This week in the Enterprise Security News, we discuss how Sysdig is supporting Google Cloud for the Anthos Secure Serverless Workloads in production. Wow, that was a mouthful. StackRock's Kubernetes Security Platform 3.0 introduces some new features, including configuration and vulnerability management, and some acquisition and funding updates from CyberCube, OnePassword, Docker, White Source, and more. In the second segment, Reuven Harrison, the Chief Technical Officer at Tufin, to discuss cloud containers and microservices. In the final segment, we welcome Jorge Salamero. He's the Director of Product Management at Sysdig to discuss the challenges of implementing security in Kubernetes environments. So stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Networks are becoming increasingly complex and fragmented, and digital transformation and DevOps are driving an explosion in network connectivity changes. With each new network connection, cyber attackers may gain another opening to breach or traverse the network. At Tufin, they've pioneered a policy-based approach to network security management using automation and analytics. As a result, you can make network changes in minutes instead of days reliably and securely. To learn more about Tufin, the security policy company, go to securityweekly.com forward slash Tufin and sign up for a free evaluation. By the end of 2020, 99% of exploited vulnerabilities will be publicly disclosed and known to IT system admins. The consequences of that fact means the burglar will already be in your house because you left the front door wide open by failing to patch known vulnerabilities. How can you keep the threat actors out? Through cloud-based automation, Automox enables you to slam the door on unpatched OS and third-party vulnerabilities across your entire Windows, Mac, and Linux infrastructure. Take advantage of a free trial with Automox to not only see the vulnerability status of your infrastructure, but do something about it within minutes. Start automating the fundamentals of cyber hygiene at securityweekly.com forward slash Automox. That's securityweekly.com forward slash Automox. Most cloud threats are your responsibility, not your cloud service providers, and prevention-based security isn't enough on its own. That's why Gartner predicts that 60% of enterprise security budgets will go towards detection and response in 2020. ExtraHop RevealX Cloud delivers cloud-native network detection and response for the hybrid enterprise, the only SaaS-based NDR solution for AWS. Request your 30-day free trial of RevealX Cloud at extrahop.com forward slash trial. That's extrahop.com forward slash trial. Welcome to episode 162 of Enterprise Security Weekly for November 20th, 2019. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined by Mr. Matt Alderman here in studio. Yes, it's that time of month again. <laughs> you got the, the shirt the and the beard. Yeah, you look the beard yeah, and the, the shirt. That's right. This is what lumber. happens when you live in Colorado. You kinda, That's right. You kinda, yeah, you're a little When in Rome. <laughs> uh, make sure you register for our upcoming webcast with Kevin O'Brien of Great Horn happening tomorrow. 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's right. We'll be talking about email phishing, some interesting uh, research that we'll go over, and, of course, an awesome solution from Greathorn uh, for email phishing protection. Uh, Steve Lobenstein of Core Security will also be joining us in, in December for a webcast as well. Of course, you can go to securityweekly.com, click the webcast drop down, register for upcoming webcasts, uh, register and view our on-demand webcast in the library. And for every webcast that you attend uh, live or on-demand, you get one CPE credit per webcast. And now, the enterprise security news. You want to start at the top, or do you want to break these down? I, I was I was organizing them as you yeah. were uh, announcing. Uh, I broke them into product announcements. Yep. Uh, KubeCon this week, so a lot of Kubernetes stuff out there. Then I, I broke down uh, kind of the acquisitions and, and the funding. Sure. So kind of broke Let's them do apart. the product first. Yeah. Uh, Elusive Networks. This one, I... I'm kind of challenging a little bit, I think, but uh, I'm assuming that there is evidence. So, uh, and this isn't the only announcement. I think that um, mm -hmm. when we get to the acquisitions, Checkpoint made an acquisition in this space. And basically, uh, OT and IoT attack surfaces, right? And so Elusive made an announcement that they're extending their product to provide deception for more OT and IoT and network devices in their announcement. 
Uh, and Checkpoint, of course, made the acquisition of Simplify. Sim Simplify, yeah. Simpl but C Y M P L I F Y. Yes. I've not. Have we we haven't covered no, covered we have them. Not okay. covered them. It sounds like a firmware analysis company. Am I? It, it, did I read that wrong? No, I think you're right. Okay. In the IoT space, yeah. In the IoT space, mm -hmm. right? And so, what I found interesting. Now, don't get me wrong. Tons of the attack land a surface and the vulnerability landscape is ripe for the picking has been for probably well over 15 years ever since we first had embedded devices the problem really hasn't gotten that much better right correct uh but what tufin says is that adversaries are increasing their focus on non-traditional it attack surfaces and concerns raised by ev the evaporating perimeter security in the areas of iot and ot are impacting transformation efforts um, according to uh, Ofer uh, from Elusive Networks. From Elusive Networks. He's the CEO and founder of Elusive Networks. I'm not necessarily disputing their claim. I just want to see the evidence. Like, what data do we have that we can go to to say that we're noticing a shift in, or, or what, did, what did exactly did he say? Uh, is increase increase focus is is how uh, over and again I I'm not disputing that very well could be the case um, I just I want to see the reports and the data that uh, you can observe attackers uh, more attacks happening on the more traditional as, as over puts it uh, surface and then show more attacks on the IoT side but right. the the data can very easily be skewed because how much visibility do we have into OT and IoT? And is it because products from Elusive, right? They make an awesome product. Are they giving us more visibility into IoT attacks? So therefore, we're noticing more and noticing an uptick, right? I, I'm not. So there's lots of ways you could spin. Yeah, spin I mean, when, when you dissect this statement, and then we'll get into where... I have concerns. Right. You and I don't want to pick on uh, Elusive or Ofer. Yeah, and I mean, like everybody's... The, yeah, look, they have a great product. We've done briefings with them. It, they're a great company, great Everybody's products. trying to figure out IoT and OT mm -hmm. because they are new emerging attack surfaces. And, and if you listen to anybody, they're like, yeah, but IoT is going to add billions of devices to the network and therefore I can increase my revenue substantially. Mm -hmm. Maybe. It depends on which technology vertical you're in and right. whether you see IoT devices or you don't, right? But a lot of people use those two environments as a way to justify a bigger TAM when it comes to a marketing perspective and valuation. Sure. So let's put that aside for a second. I look at this and say, okay, do we have evidence to your point mm -hmm. of more attacks on, we see IoT attacks, we've seen OT attacks, but are they more right. than IT attacks? Are they more than traditional phishing attacks that still work, which we'll talk about in, tomorrow. In but the, in, in which the, verticals do we see them, right? right? I see them more on the consumer side. You see them IoT. on the consumer side. You Not so much on the, I don't see, uh, and I could be wrong, but it just in general, very unscientifically, I don't see it so much on the enterprise side. Correct. It, Unless you're in very specific Verticals. Verticals. Like healthcare. Uh, healthcare would be one. Uh, oil and gas. Even, energy. even at that, oil and gas and energy aside, because I think there we have seen a lot of attacks against infrastructure. But when we go to the healthcare side, I've seen a lot of research, not necessarily an increase in attack. Again, just from yeah. what I'm right. observing from the news, right? And then the other thing that's in here is impacting transformation efforts. Look, there's a lot of things impacting transformation efforts, yep. including like, a set of goals and a vision and, and a plan to execute. So I'm not sure I, IoT and OT are the cause of impacting transformation of no, efforts because I, I think, think I they think enter there are a lot into of the, challenges. I think it's very smart that they do enter into the equation because if you're planning a digital transformation that requires you to implement IoT devices, maybe you maybe go, not. holy crap, how can I put these devices inside my network when we know, based on the data that we have, that the manufacturers of uh, software and hardware of those devices just haven't put the security controls in place, let alone the visibility that I need to yeah. monitor those. True. The inherent vulnerabilities in those systems are like numerous. So if I'm moving forward with digital transformation and I got to deploy a whole bunch of sensors and IoT devices, maybe I'm not going to do that. Maybe you're not. Right? Um, th where I really want to understand, what I want to understand, uh, and... and now that we have a developer, you could probably get a briefing from them again. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of IoT and OT emulations can they actually do? H here's the challenge for me, is 
That's a simple thing to say, but it's actually a very hard thing to do. Think about all the different IoT and OT variants that are out there. OT has a lot of non-traditional protocols. How do you emulate those? Uh, even the OT vendors who have focused a lot of effort on these non-traditional protocols are still building out their expertise in this. So how do you emulate that on the OT side? So how many protocols do they support to be able to emulate this? That's where I want to understand mm -hmm. where the rubber meets the road in this is how many different types of IoT emulations and OT emulations can you right. do? And is it significant enough to actually have an impact or is there still a lot of work to do to make this really effective? Yeah, and it depends on how customizable those are as well. Could yeah. be. The base yeah. protocol is pretty easy, I think, to emulate. But uh, when you get into some very vendor specific things, I think it comes down to how customizable the product is. Yeah, so you think Modbus is easy to emulate? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a very, very basic <laughs> protocol, right? It is, but how it's used and where it's The used implementations and, vary. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. And again, that comes down to customizability. How do you want it to respond to this particular query? Exactly. So I think it's a great idea. The question yes. is, is there enough there there? Yeah, Sorry. exactly. And, and checkpoint the same thing. I, I agree with your statement on, you know, increasing their total uh, addressable market, right? Mm -hmm. um, expanding out into IoT seems to be like the thing to do. Again, it does, but again, how much of is it enterprise driven? How many? So, uh, let's take a step back. How many people are implementing checkpoint firewalls at home? Yeah, well, the they're other not. And where do you see the majority of IoT type of devices? You see it in the consumer side. You see it at the home side. So, I, I, my guess is checkpoint's not going to do what Semantic did and bifurcate themselves and decide to be an enterprise and a consumer play. But <laughs> you've also got the product security play in there too as a third dimension to this whole equation. In companies that are producing IoT devices, um, I mean, the big ones, right? You look at uh, holiday shopping, you look at Apple, Google, and Amazon, I mean, they're producing massive quantities of IoT devices. There is a play to help the manufacturers secure their products. The problem is they don't want that. They need to be cranking out new technology right. as fast as possible, not just the first version, but the second, third, and fourth versions so that with new features so that people upgrade. People aren't upgrading because of um, security reasons, right? In fact, a lot of people are hesitant because of privacy concerns, mm -hmm. which is uh, an offshoot of the, the security discussion, but not really. Right? A lot of people are either ripping out or not putting this technology in place because but, of privacy concerns. But if I'm Apple, Google, Amazon, I'm not going to Checkpoint to do that. I'm going no. to a specialized IoT firmware vendor like a Finite State or somebody like that that understands right. this or stuff. Or just build it in an in-house Or they're going to build it yeah, in themselves, build it in right? right? So again, I get it. They're going to go after this IoT space. But again, if we don't see the who's issues... Who's the customer? Right, who's <laughs> the customer? If we don't see it in the enterprise... Now are they going to shift to to uh, the consumer base? No, I don't. I, but I think semantic saying, proves that that. I'm didn't not work saying out it's not well. in the enterprise, but a lot of the data that we see and cover and even collect on our own shows that organizations are still struggling struggling with the more traditional IT security mm -hmm. things. Right? If you talk to the vendors in email phishing, which we've done a lot of, uh, not a lot, but some research uh, it lately, their customers are largely, from what I've heard, from the past year, right moving towards traditional email gateways to better technology that's solving the email phishing problem or trying to solve it as best that they can, right? Mm -hmm. We've also seen where in our recent survey that we did that organizations are planning on projects like threat hunting, which is really important, right? And I would put in your traditional uh, security bucket, they're not planning for IoT, right? That's way further out or uh, not, even on, out. not even on the list. I mean, if you're still looking at upgrading your email phishing protection and implementing a threat your hunting platform. Your brute force login, your right. malware, then you're going to go to VM, which has been around for it's, 20 plus years. Yeah. Uh, Where's IoT's your way IoT? the scale. It's not on the list of all the things, not just our own surveys, but other people's as well. Right. So that's, that's yeah. my point. That's uh, what I wanted to get to before we moved on. Okay. In any case. So KubeCon is this week in San Diego. Yes. So lots of Kubernetes announcements, including yep. an interesting spin-off slash acquisition we'll get over on the other side. But uh, StackRox announced uh, updated Kubernetes security um, capabilities. Sysdig, who's coming on for the second interview, has also done some stuff with yeah, Kubernetes. Yeah, Jorge's going to dig into some uh, Kubernetes. Exactly. Stuff. Yep. yep. Which will be a great uh, session. We interviewed... Um, 
uh, Pavin from Sistig mm-hmm. on ASW on Monday. So again, you're seeing a lot of news for for uh, Kubernetes, which makes a lot of sense because it's uh, KubeCon. Uh, New Vector also releasing security policies, code capabilities for Kubernetes. Right. So, look, we w- here's what we know. Kubernetes has won the orchestration game, mm-hmm. uh, and if the Docker Enterprise uh, spin out. <laughs> To Marantis doesn't tell you the future of, of Docker and Kubernetes. Uh, nothing will, and we'll get into that in a little, little bit. Um, so you're going to see a lot of people continue to go after Kubernetes. There's a ton of startups in the space that are all working on Kubernetes-specific security solutions. These are three established vendors yep. moving from traditional container-based stuff into the Kubernetes to provide additional visibility and control into that layer. Uh, this makes a lot of sense for all three of these vendors. Unlike our previous discussion, right? This makes a whole lot of sense. In, yes. In even a lot of people's experiences, including our own. You start with a traditional application, or maybe you just start with an application inside containers. Uh, pretty quickly, you realize that that stuff has to be broken out. <laughs> right? And as your application grows, and one of the realizations that that we had is that we're much closer to not just one application, but three, five, six different applications that we're splitting out and making that easy is the uh, management and container architecture that allows us to break those apart, right? It's both software and, you know, protocol mm-hmm. kind of base design yep. that allows us to say, well, that's a separate application. That's a, And now you end up with more containers then you end up with multiple containers representing your application. Then you multiply that by the number of environments you have. And pretty quickly, you're like, we need an orchestration platform. And so now we turn to Kubernetes, which has been chosen, right? Has been the proven technology uh, for doing this. Right. So it makes sense that security vendors are helping e- us with the security. Everybody of that. is flocking to Kubernetes. Mm-hmm. Um, right, wrong, or indifferent. Um, I think it's right because it is the de facto orchestrator. Yeah. Everybody's looking to add additional layers of security into Kubernetes. So like I said, these are three established container security companies going into the space, and you're going to see more startups announce and come out mm-hmm. um, that are going after this as well. The interesting one that is not KubeCon related is Sysdig support for uh, Anthos. Mm. And for those who don't know what Anthos is, uh, Google announced Anthos uh, a couple months back at their next conference, I believe it was. And Anthos is going to allow enterprises to run and manage workloads across multiple clusters, clouds, and hardware, including on-premise. And so what you're seeing Google do is say, look, we get it. We're not going to be the only cloud vendor in the world. There's Mm -hmm. multiples, um, but we're going to provide management capabilities across these clouds, on-prem, et cetera, and and try to make a seamless service for those people that are going to run hybrid and multi-cloud. Sysdig is one of the launch partners. Um, There's a couple others. There's not very many in the launch partner list for this. Uh, uh, Biarca is another one, which Mm -hmm. which really focuses on configuration and GCP. I think there's only like three or four launch partners. This is interesting because what Google's trying to do is say, look, even if you run an AWS or Azure, we can help you manage those cloud environments. So they're trying to be the all-encompassing solution and and having some of these early players like Sysdig and others. I feel like a lot of things Google does is very binary. Like either it's really awesome or it really sucks. So we're going to find out. One or the other, (laughs) right? (laughs) <laughs> and they've got a, they've had a look they've had a lot of misses not just security related but technology related they have. they've had a lot of misses but when they get it right it's usually like a really, kubernetes yeah they got it right and it's now the de facto but yes there are examples where they don't i think this is a play for google to really figure out how they uh have mind share when they're the third of mm-hmm. the three bigs, right. right? They have to do something to continue to to um, make GCP and in, in what Google's building um, attractive to the market, and and Anthos is well, like is anyone, right. they have the opportunity to do it really well or really screw it up, and mm-hmm. they've just they've had a lot of things that they've really screwed up. Yeah, and GCP has not been a success. Per se, right? I mean, it but is that because they has its screwed place. it up, or just they're working on adoption? I think they partially screwed it up. I don't want to get sure. into aspects of that, but I think there are some moves they made a few years ago that really didn't help them in the space. I thought they had a niche when it came to uh, big data and analytics. 
I thought if they did some uh, additional things around security, they could have mm -hmm. created a niche for themselves. Amazon latch, latched onto some of that from a security perspective and really just leapfrogged. Right. Where I thought Google could have done if something. If you look at some of their other technology, I mean, YouTube, they just continue to make really strange decisions. Um, but if you look at the consumer YouTube TV, I think it's awesome. Like it's, it's all, I mean, if you can get over that, you have to pay and still work, watch commercials. The the way they've structured that platform, there's no reason for anyone to have cable, and they they do a fantastic job at that, making it easy. Uh, but then you look at like Ring and some of their other devices. Their AI engine is with the Google thing is the Google Assistant is pretty awesome. It, it really is. It's better, I think, than any of the other assistants out there in terms of understanding uh, humans and natural language. My experience, they tend to be the best. However, in the, some of the devices and acquisitions they've had, they, they tend to kind of screw it up a little bit, and then they get into controversy, right, with privacy issues, right. like with the Ring See, and the Neighborhood app and all I, that I, stuff. I think a lot of this is the pressure from the federal government and mm -hmm. other governments on the privacy side, because yeah. Google takes a big hit for a lot of that, not only in the search engine, but in YouTube and yep. all these other things. And and I think that influences decisions elsewhere to potentially screw things up because right. they're so sensitive to that in some right. respects. Yeah, like Drive is a hot mess. And because <laughs> you think like usability wise, it should be awesome, right? But if you look at the Drive API, it's pretty good API to work with. It's so better it's than the YouTube API. <laughs> they can have one product and screw up like one aspect of it, but really knock it out of the park with the other aspect. So I think you're going to see a lot of that moving back to security in Google Cloud with, with their platform. I think certain aspects of their platform are going to be like, wow, that is the best option. But you're going to suffer when you try and use some of the other aspects and yeah. in, in, uh, features in their products. Yep. Uh, that was most of the product news. Now it's a bunch of acquisition and funding news. Mm. Um, I got the Sonatype one up first. Oh, wait, no. Um, wait, so, did I miss uh, one? Yeah, HelpNet Security did a really great job, and I want to call them out because they're one of the sites that we use to pull uh, news articles and announcements for the show. Um, Mirko Zors is the, uh, one of the, the chief editor there. He did a great job. He released an article that was basically new InfoSec products of the week. Um, so we've got a, we talked about Sysdig is in there. Uh, JamF is a Mac endpoint protection solution. Um, Zero North is... Um, I know Zero North. Dry, it says uh, security into DevOps. Yeah, right? so what Zero North is trying to do is integrate a lot of the um, application uh, tool pipeline mm -hmm. pieces together. So think of what Kenna does on the vulnerability management ah, side. Gotcha. Yep. Uh, Zero North, and there's a couple other vendors out there that are really focused more on the AppSec side, so SaaS, DAS, SCA, et cetera, et cetera, trying to pull all that together from a prioritization standpoint. BitGlass has some kind of smart edge thing that they released that I haven't dug into, it, and they've got a, a pretty picture. The one that I like, it, it kind of ties into the interview we did the other day on BSW and Business Security Weekly. Hive IO, uh, deploy virtualization technology without vendor complexity. Um, so uh, enables users to deploy virtual desktops, virtual servers, and software-defined storage in a single install. That, I think, is pretty cool. It's Potentially, yes. Potentially. Potentially. Yeah. I like, if you're using those environments, yes. I like that technology that removes the application from the desktop or removes the desktop entirely and puts it up in the cloud or, or even in your own cloud, right? And uh, allows you, I think it's a great opportunity for security. Now, there's certainly ways be. around it, right? But, you know, we talked with um, uh, Authenticate, right? Yeah. Do a similar thing. They basically take the browser and stick it in the cloud. And there's a, a lot of really great security benefits to that. Yes, because when you can um, break apart the, apart the browser and mm -hmm. inspect the browser and prevent crazy stuff from happening in the browser, it's more secure at the right. end of the day. Um, the only challenge with some of these solutions is they're focused well, on a lot of VMware challenges. and hypervisors and SDNs, but you're also getting that from your cloud provider. So the cloud providers are doing aspects of that for you. Um, this is great when you're in a hybrid environment or mm -hmm. a lot of on-prem. Um, how does uh, it scale when you Manageability and, and scalability are the yes, issues uh, with these platforms. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. So now uh, acquisitions and funding announcements. Yes. A One number of these. Uh, one password raised $200 million in a Series A. Okay, so 
l- let me just say for the record, a, a $200 million Series A is not a Series A. <laughs> In traditional sense, right? Sure. Um, so my guess is, look, they've been around for, what, 14 years, something like that, bootstrapped a business. I think part of this is an equity buyout um, mm-hmm. for some of the founders, um, just to be clear, right? I mean, we, we, we've seen these uh, types of deals before. When you're seeing six-figure deal, um, or nine-figure deals in this case, right? Not nine-figure deal like this. What, what you're seeing is not only an investment, but also a partial buyout of probably the right. in, initial staff to really start to set this company up for big growth because a normal Series A is not this big. Mm-hmm. Even a Series B isn't this big. These are C, D, E levels. Um, so my guess is this is great for the 1Password founders probably uh, and the employees to get some additional revenue to grow, but it's, it's not a traditional A. In terms of the market though, like how much of a lifespan does a password manager have? Well, a lot of this depends on the future of the identity and the password, right? right? I, I, Which is largely moving in a direction that goes beyond uh-huh. the requirement to have a password manager. Right. However, that is such a slow move. And I, I get it. There are certain countries, there are certain government agencies, enterprises that have really worked towards solving this authentication and authorization and identity issue and re- removing the password from a lot of those cases. However, we're still there. You're still going to end up with a whole ton of passwords. Yes, a ton. Still today. I, I, I do see that uh, eventually getting better, but that's uh, could be five, ten plus years away. Yeah, it, but there is definitely a, a lifespan for these. And like I said, a $200 million Series A, is just, it's not a standard Series A. Right. It, it's like tenable Series B. It was not a traditional Series B. Right. It just wasn't. Um, so yeah, so that's my guess. Um, partial buyout, par- partial funding. Uh, Vista acquires a majority interest in Sonatype. Yep. Um, again, we've seen a number of these this year, private equity firms getting mm-hmm. into the space, looking to expand their portfolio. Security is hot. Uh, you take Sonatype that's done a lot on, on, uh, software composition analysis and open source and other things. Which I, I really think that's a great investment because I don't think Sonatype took on a lot of money at all. No, it I has don't think so. a ton of customers. Like their organic yeah. growth was just amazing. Yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, well, Vista was 70,000 employees, but um, I was trying to see if they had a account for Sonatype. But you know, Sonatype's been around for a long time, since 2010, really doing some interesting space, really early into software composition analysis mm-hmm. and, and open source analysis, kind of saw what was coming before mm-hmm. a lot of other people. So they, they've been around for a long time. Uh, I think this is great for, for them um, and, and the employees because that means they, they have the resources they need to continue to grow. Mm-hmm. Unlike um, the Docker Enterprise acquisition, uh, we covered this on ASW um, because uh, <laughs> obviously this has a big impact on the container side. And what's interesting about this, um, I spent a lot of time with the Docker folks when I was at Layered Insight. And, you know, Docker was really trying to figure out their enterprise business because what was really happening is Red Hat OpenShift was just eating their lunch mm-hmm. from an enterprise container platform. And it was KubeCon, I think, three years ago now when docker made the announcement to support kubernetes and basically put a fork into swarm their own orchestration engine and ever since that point the docker enterprise product has struggled to gain traction in the marketplace and so what you see now is docker say look we're going to go back kind of to our roots to the developers and give up on the enterprise business um that's a pretty telling sign to me that um on the do- on the enterprise side of of containers, uh, Red Hat and and a few others have really uh, made it tough for for Docker, who really put containers on on the market. Right? I mean, they sure. made it so easy for containerization. Um, but it sounds like they're focused on the SaaS offering now. Well, what they're focused on is Docker Desktop and Docker Hub. Now, mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you right now, as a registry, Docker Hub is not all that in a bag of chips. Yeah. Okay, there's a ton of other registry platforms out right. there. It's and, also and easy to stand up your own registry, exactly. too. Exactly. So, Hub, eh, mm-hmm. okay, unless they can do some interesting things in Hub to make it more viable, I, I just well, don't hub, see... Well, Hub also encompasses the uh, standard builds for containers that you get, too. Yes, but again, but again, how do you monetize? I can go yeah, get. Right. I can go get 
and grab some of this stuff too. Right. So, I can and build, then I can also build it myself too. It's really it's, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then the de uh, Docker desktop again, going after the developer side where kind of some of their roots for, but again, they've lost traction in that market with other developer tools and providing capabilities are more, more much more holistic. So uh, I think this is bad news for Docker personally, um, because enterprise was their way to continue to, to grow. Yeah. And now they don't really have that engine. They took another 35 million on the Docker side of what was left, but uh, I, I'm not sure Docker as a company survives <clears throat> this transition. Um, and we'll see what Mirantis does with Docker Enterprise mm. because now they're going up against Red Hat um, on a day-to-day -day basis and OpenShift has taken a, a big chunk of this market. So um, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Uh, we covered the Simplify piece a bit. Uh, white Source. Oh yeah, White Source. Back uh, to Software Inventory. Yes, Renovate. Um, so this was an interesting one because when you think about the the dependency challenges in open source, right? And all the libraries and binaries that are embedded and dependent on things. What people have to realize is there's a lot of old uh, binaries un uh, under the covers, a lot of vulnerabilities, a lot of issues with that. Um, so the ability to tie what white source is doing on, on the software composition analysis piece with Renovate, who understands the interdependency piece, I think is a great marriage actually, because this is where we're going to continue to see vulnerabilities popping up in, in these container ecosystems is because of all these old libraries. Mm -hmm. Was there anything else? Um, Cybercube raises 35 million Series B. That's a forge point semantic spin out uh, focused on cyber insurance. This is a growing market. Mm -hmm. uh, vendors are going to continue to grow in that space. Uh, that was the last one in this um, list of articles. Awesome. Uh, with that, we'll take a short break and come back with a couple of interviews. Stay tuned. <laughs> 